um, city uh, and county governments in Kansas, what they do and how are they financed. Tonight's session is made possible by the generous support of Humanities Kansas. I'd like to turn the mic over to Humanities Kansas board member Tom Bell for a few words before I introduce tonight's speaker. Well, so thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone. Good evening. I, I know everybody wants to uh, get onto the program and so do I, but I just wanted to, to say thank you uh, on behalf of Humanities Kansas. Humanities Kansas is a statewide organization that partners with organizations like the Lawrence Public Library to explore literature, traditions, history, and to connect place and people across generations. And there's almost nothing more important than that these days. Uh, I'm very excited to be on the board. I'm very excited for the program tonight. And this is the 50th year uh, anniversary of Humanities Kansas. So if you have any questions about the organization, want any more information, there's some in the back. Mostly though, I wanna say thank you to people like Melissa, who uh, organize these events, to groups like the League of Women Voters, who sponsor them, people like Virgil, who give up their time and expertise, and to people like in the audience who come and work this work. So thank you again and welcome. Thank you, Tom. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Virgil Dean is a native Kansan and a Lawrence resident since 1983. Was editor of Kansas History, a journal of the Central Plains, the quarterly publication of the Kansas State Historical Society for more than 20 years. He subsequently served eight years as consulting editor for the journal, which in 2012 became a joint publication of the Kansas Historical Foundation and the Department of History, Kansas State University. He has been a lecturer instructor in the departments of history at the University of Kansas and Kansas State University, an adjunct professor at Washburn and Emporia State Universities, and a humanities scholar for a variety of humanities Kansas projects over the years. Dean received his PhD in U.S. History from the University of Kansas, and his most significant publications include four books, An Opportunity Lost, The Truman Administration and the Post-War Farm Policy Debate, John Brown to Bob Dole, Movers and Shakers in Kansas History, Territorial Kansas Reader, and Lawrence, Images of America. Please welcome Virgil Dean. Okay, I better do this first. <laughs> That. Here. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, as you can tell from my publications, I did, I haven't published anything on the Wyandotte Constitution, uh, but I, uh, as a preliminary here, uh, if you're interested in, in how I got interested in it and what I, why I did, uh, we can talk about that later, perhaps, at the end. What I plan to do, because it works best for me, is just, and hopefully it will be all right with you, is to just give you a formal presentation for about 30 minutes, some slides and some uh, text, and then uh, open it up for, for discussion. And uh, we'll get there as quick as we can, but I need to have something to start with. Founding documents have been simply defined as documents shaped that shape uh, or help shape a particular state or, un or nation. But, but there are, is no single list of founding documents and no consensus on where to draw the line with respect to the documents that should or should not be, be called founding documents. Clearly, uh, all would agree that the United States Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, uh, and the uh, Bill of Rights uh, are documents for the, for the nation that would be founding documents. What about the 50 states? For Kansas, the Secretary of State, State's Office identifies three, the Organic Act, an act to organize the territory of Kansas, an act uh, for the admission of Kansas into the Union, and of course, the Kansas State Constitution, or the originally the Wyandotte Constitution of 1859. If one applies 
A more expansive interpretation of the founding documents, however, certain key treaties with the region's indigenous peoples, as well as those of who, uh, who that resulted in removal uh, and settlement of the eastern tribes uh, in Indian territory west of, the, of Missouri, could also be included. Or probably should also be included. For purposes of our purposes today, however, uh, we will focus on those founding documents most directly linked to the creation of the state, most notably the Wyandotte Constitution. Before looking more closely at, the, at this Wyandotte Constitution, to which Abraham Lincoln favorably referred on his uh, one and only visit uh, to Kansas, perhaps we should look briefly and what preceded it, those early documents and events that made the Wyandotte Convention of 1859 necessary and possible. As part of the Louisiana Purchase Territory, during uh, the first decades of the 19th century, Kansas was, unor was unorganized territory. So what uh, would become Kansas became part of the U.S. because of the Purchase agreement or the Louisiana Purchase Agreement in 1803, our first founding document in a sense. Next, next would uh, be the Missouri Compromise. Next would be the Missouri Compromise of 1820 which brought Maine into the Union as a free state and Missouri as a slave state. And for uh, over three decades seemed to, be, seemed to settle uh, the issue of slavery in this area. The remaining so-called, oops, I'm wrong here. The remaining so-called unorganized territory west of Missouri became part of Indian territory. Uh, and the home of numerous Indian peoples, uh, Plains tribes and less nomadic Indians, such as the Kansas, Pawnees, and Osages. The U.S. began a systematic policy to drastically reduce the Indian land base from Ohio to the, the Ohio Valley to Georgia before 1820, but the policy became intractable during the administration of Andrew John Jackson and culminated in the formal Indian Removal Act of 1830. The policy provided for the exchange of Indian lands in the east for new lands west of Missouri and Arkansas. Thus, the Indian Territory, sometimes called the permanent Indian, and you can put that in quotes, I guess, the permanent Indian frontier was shared after 1830 with about 20 different tribes from east of the Missouri River. Oh. So we have a, a, te a technical difficulty. Well, technical difficulty for the people that are zooming. Yeah. Water break. As the country grew largely at the expense of the, of the indigenous population, the precarious free state slave state balance was maintained uh, until California was admitted to the union with the compromise of 1850. The balance was upset, but the new fugitive slave law that was included in that compromise temporarily modified the South. Problems soon arose or soon arose again, however, when expansionist pressures called for the actual creation of territories in the northern portion of the old Louisiana Territory. As a result, the U.S. Congress passed and President Franklin Pierce signed the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854. Largely uh, the handiwork of Senator Stephen A. Douglas, the namesake of Douglas County, of course, uh, the, uh, the uh, 
Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 repealed the Missouri Compromise and created two territories out of the remaining Louisiana Territory. The newly created Kansas Territory was thrown open for settlement uh, before any land was really ready or legally uh, to legally receive the onrush of Euro-American invaders. So land disputes arose immediately, as did political conflict over the uh, major issues uh, of the, the issue of the era, slavery, in large part because uh, the uh, because in addition to its many other features, this organic act, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, contained the principle of popular sovereignty, which is contained in section 19. Of the, uh, of the Kansas Nebraska. Specifically, it provided that the territories shall receive into the Union with or without, or shall be received into the Union with or without slavery as their constitution may prescribe at the time of their admission. This is found in the middle part of, the, of section 19. In, the, uh, in, in retrospect, at least, the, all the, uh, all this guarantee, all of this guaranteed that Kansas would be hotly contested territory. I think it's interesting to note that it provided for the, the Constitution, the, as the Constitution may, be, may, may prescribe. So it was no, like we often say, uh, kind of in, to be in brief, you know, the settlers were to vote on slavery up or down. Well, kind of, <laughs> but uh, it's the Constitution making process that becomes key here. The Kansas question became the focus of an emotionally charged national debate, and in the territory soon called Bleeding Kansas, the two sides squared off in a sometimes violent contest. It is not, uh, it is not an exaggeration to say that it was the big issue nationally, at least in, 19, in 1856. The Kansas question is a big and many faceted question as you all know, I'm sure, but uh, we're going to focus on just one facet, the more immediate antecedents of the, of the Wyandotte Constitution uh, and uh, or Wyandotte Convention and Constitution, the process of Constitution making that uh, took up an inordinate amount of time during this era. The first of four such efforts was initiated by the Free State Partisans, uh, who, by Free State Partisans in 1855, and labeled uh, in 1855 labeled the. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, was initiated by Free State Partisans who in 1855 labeled the legally recognized government of the territory bogus. The government that was elected in the spring of 1855, mostly by Missouri voters who. I had no intention of staying in Kansas too long. And of course, the free staters who were coming in at the time did not recognize that government, even though the federal government did. The Topeka, uh, the free state delegates assembled at Topeka on October 23rd, 1855, to draft a constitution under which they hoped, the, uh, hoped to be admitted to the Union. The document was approved overwhelmingly on December 15th. Uh, the pro-slavery law and order party uh, did not participate. It provided slavery, or prohibited slavery, but would have excluded free blacks and mulattoes from the state. The Topeka Convention actually provided for a separate vote on a, an exclusionary clause that would have made, been the main part of the, uh, of the Constitution, and it passed overwhelmingly as well. This would be this would be founding document limited suffrage to white males and quote every male Indian who has adopted the habits of the white man. And it adopted the boundaries as set by the Kansas uh, Nebraska Act, although Cong uh, Congress rejected this Constitution and request for statehood, the so called Topeka movement remained active uh, for another three years. Kansas's second constitutional convention 
uh, was authorized by the federally recognized pro-slavery territorial legislature in 1857. It met at Lecompton in the fall of the year, and in December submitted the document uh, to the voters. About, um, but the vote was to be on a, a special slavery article only for the Constitution without slavery or with slavery. Uh, so free staters refused to participate, and the Constitution with slavery, not surprisingly, won uh, by an overwhelming margin. Months of controversy followed, featuring, uh, among other things, a bitter national debate that split the Democratic Party uh, right down the middle. In the meantime, however, Kansas elected a new free state legislature on October 5, 1857, ultimately defeated the Lecompton Constitution at the polls and wrote and ratified on May 18, 1858, a second free state document, the Leavenworth Constitution. Although like Topeka, uh, in many ways, the Leavenworth document was more radical. The word white did not appear in the proposed in this document, Constitution, and it would, have, uh, would not have excluded uh, free Negroes and uh, mulattoes from the state. Serious efforts on its behalf, however, ended with the final defeat of the Lecompton Constitution uh, in uh, the Compton, Compton document in August 1858. With the Free State faction firmly in control by the fall of 1858, the uh, Territorial Legislature of 1859 approved a fourth and, as it turned out, final constitutional convention. And in early June, delegates were elected to gather at Wyandotte on July 5th uh, to, uh, to begin their work. 35 Republicans and 17 Democrats were chosen to attend. Interestingly, this was the first time uh, these now familiar uh, party labels uh, were used. The Republican Party had been formed in the territory uh, in just a few months before. Democratic Party had kind of emerged uh, from the so-called Law and Order Party in the, in the previous months. Who were these men who wrote in the, this founding document and thus became Kansas's founding fathers? For one thing, they were not individuals most of us would recognize today as leaders of the free state movement. In fact, most were not know, even widely known at the time. There was no Charles Robinson, no Jim Lane, no Thomas Ewing, no John Brown, of course. In later years, the four delegates pictured here would be among the best known. Overall, though, the uh, delegates were relatively young, a relatively young lot. Their average age was just 35. The oldest delegate, Robert Graham, was 55. The convention's youngest delegate, D.F. Simpson, a native of Ohio, was a 23-year-old bachelor lawyer from Paola. Simpson was one of 18 lawyers among the 52 delegates uh, to the uh, 1859 convention. There were also 16 farmers, eight merchants, three manufacturers, three physicians, a mechanic, a land agent, a printer, and a surveyor. Four of the delegates, including Graham, uh, were foreign born, one each from England, Scotland, Ireland, and Germany. The New, Orleans, the New England states contributed 11 delegates, and Ohio alone had 14. The rest came from Indiana, Pennsylvania, New York, Kentucky, and one from Virginia, the only real Southern state to be represented. What was to become the founding document of the state of Kansas, the Wyandotte Constitution, 
establish the basic uh, basic law and structure of government. Most of its provisions were not particularly controversial. The Wyandotte delegates patterned their document after the Constitution of Ohio. They also borrowed ideas from other states, particularly Indiana, and of course the earlier rejected Kansas Constitution. The Wyandotte instrument began with an ordinance which dealt almost exclusively with the, relate, uh, with the relationship between the U.S. government and Kansas regarding the public, public lands. This was also immediate, or this was immediate, followed immediately by a preamble, we the people of Kansas. As it turned out, uh, interestingly, one of the more controversial issues was addressed in this last part of this opening preamble, where the proposed boundary lines were spelled out. The first three constitutions written in Kansas adopted the existing boundaries of the Kansas Territory. The eastern boundary, eastern, northern, and southern, more or less, borders were the same as they are today. The western border, however, extended as far as the Continental Divide and included the Pikes Peak gold fields. Although more, uh, not a major issue at the earlier assemblies, at Wyandotte, the boundary question caused much controversy. Many delegates saw this huge territory as a disadvantage and sought to fix the western border far to the east of the Rockies. Democratic delegates also wanted the state's northern border extended to the Platte River. And they actually had a delegation from southern Nebraska that, uh, that uh, came down and were uh, unofficial. Uh, delegates at the convention were, were able to debate if they chose to. The Republicans, uh, for reasons we can talk about later, uh, united to defeat this, this effort to expand, to take in additional territory in both the West uh, or in the North and then later as it turns out in the West. The old Northern border was retained uh, at the 40th parallel North latitude. Uh, the, uh, as was the southern border, the 37th parallel, uh, this was not really settled until 1867 because of Indian claim, land claims in the area, but it, it pretty much worked itself out to what, it showed, what, it showed, what they expected it to. Uh, the western border was fixed at the 25th meridian of longitude west of from Washington or the 102nd west longitude or 102 degrees west longitude from Prime Meridian and Greenwich. Kansas emerged from the convention with its present rectangular shape. The preamble was followed by the Bill of Rights. 20 sections, uh, 20 sections, similar in part to the U.S. Bill of Rights, but beginning with Section 1, all men are possessed of equal and inalienable natural rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What is more, what is really, which is really more reflective, of course, of the Declaration of Independence. The Bill of Rights is really the only portion of the Wyandotte Constitution which has not been radically altered since the uh, since that over time. One section, one one exception is uh, Section Four of the Bill of Rights. The people have a right to keep and bear arms. This was amended in 2010 to read, a person has the right to keep and bear arms for the defense of self, family, and home and state. As uh, you can see, the emphasis now is on the individual right uh, to possess firearms. The new wording brought Kansas, the Kansas Amendment into line with the U.S. Constitution, the U.S. Supreme Court's new interpretation, I should say, of the Second Amendment uh, in uh, District of Columbia versus Heller, which is cited in 2008. To date, Kansas has approved only one additional uh, or addition to the Bill of Rights, Section 21, which was ratified in 2016. Uh, a rather curious amendment 
uh, to the Bill of Rights, in my opinion at least, uh, which is uh, to protect the right to hunt, fish, and trap wildlife. The so-called value them both amendment uh, voted down in August would have been the 22nd addition to the Bill of Rights. Section six of the Bill of Rights, uh, there shall be no slavery in Kansas. Although much of the necessary work of the convention uh, should be described as mundane, a few issues in addition to boundaries stirred up considerable controversy and spirited debate. Slavery and civil or human rights, uh, for example. In fact, the place of African Americans in society uh, came up repeatedly at the convention. Everyone assumed that Kansas was to be a free state by the time the convention opened in July of 1859. And the delegates easily inserted a clause prohibiting slavery, uh, in, slavery in the Bill of Rights, Section 6. Without discussion, it passed, and then it passed 48 to, not, to 1, 48 to 1. Um, but in, eight, in the 1850s, as I'm sure most of you know, opposition to slavery seldom, almost never, meant acceptance of equal rights, political or social. Many delegates, Republicans and Democrats, supported an exclusionary clause, and the Democratic press, press claimed uh, two thirds of Kansans wanted to uh, or wanted a free white state. And that's what you can. Uh -oh. no, that's... You can see the top. Uh, I was going to try to use the point. Uh, the top one is from the Fort Scott Free, uh, Fort Scott Democrat, August 18, 1859. Just an example of the uh, Democratic press's uh, take on the Kansas population. Exclusion ultimately failed, but it had uh, its ardent supporters, like William C. McDowell, the second quote up here, a Leavenworth Democrat from Ohio. Among Republicans, sentiments such as those expressed by another Ohio native, Topeka delegate, and, and a, a free stater, John P. Greer, uh, were common. An Anderson County Republican, James Blunt, personally opposed exclusion, but called for a popular vote. And this seems to be kind of a, a pretty common uh, theme among uh, the free state uh, par partisans that they were willing to put this question before the voters. Support of equal rights was virtually non-existent among the delegates who really did want a free white state. Following the Bill of Rights are 15 articles in a schedule. Article 1 established the executive, the governor, who had a veto power, but who had the veto power, which is kind of pretty controversial at the time, but was otherwise relatively weak, and six additional independent executive officials. A uh, major change to this article didn't come until uh, it was implemented by amendment in 1972. Uh, that executive department reorganization, change, the terms were changed and a short ballot was, at, was adopted at that time. Uh, the original uh, article included 16 sections, uh, and it still has 16 sections, even though four of those have been essentially eliminated by uh, the revisions from the, 18, or from the 1970s. And, and a new section 17 is on the November ballot. Uh, the so-called legislative veto, which you probably are familiar with, and which Professor Castle talked about last month in this uh, in this uh, setting, and we can come back to if you're interested later. Article two uh, is the legislative branch. Uh, the legislative power of the state shall be vested in a House of Representatives and a Senate. There's 75 representatives and 25 senators initially. Uh, Initially, representatives were elected for one-year terms, senators for two-year terms, 
this, both, this, uh, these things were changed in the 1870s, 1873. The, t the current number of 125 representatives and 40 senators was settled on. Uh, and uh, uh, about the same time, they went to two and four year terms. Most significant change to this, this uh, amendment or this section uh, article came in 1974. And apportionment, which has always been a major controversial issue, uh, was uh, revisited during this period. Article three, the judicial branch. Originally, there was there were three uh, members from the Supreme Court: the Chief Justice and two Associate Justices, elected for six-year terms. The number of justices changed to its current seven in 1899, uh, and uh, these who uh, are now appointed by the governor. Uh, from a list of three provided by a nine member or nine person nonpartisan nominated commission and stand for retention election, as you know, only uh, instead of partisan election. This change came in 1957 with a, the first significant, a really significant uh, change in the uh, Constitution when the Missouri plan for Supreme Court justices uh, was adopted. And uh, um, and it became uh, uh, optional for lower courts. The second major change came in 1972 when the new article defined the court system as one court and put all of it under the Supreme Court supervision. We can revisit this at the end if you if you like as well. But it was also it was something that Professor Castle covered uh, the uh, last month uh, also. Article four. Uh, well, article, article four deals with elections. Uh, all elections are to be by ballot. Now, of course, also by voting device. Held annually in the beginning, changed to biannually on the first on the uh, Tuesday succeeding the first Monday in November. Then came Article five, which uh, defined eligibility uh, for voting for the suffrage. Who could vote? There was some support among the male delegates, some support among the male delegates for granting equal, right, equal voting rights to women. The majority, however, were not ready to accept such a radical idea at the time. This suffrage was granted only to every white male person of 21 years and upward. Citizens and those who, uh, of foreign birth who had declare, declared intention to become citizens. Blacks and Indians were therefore uh, denied as well. An effort to, uh, in 18, 1867, to grant full suffrage to women and Negroes uh, failed. Black men would, of course, receive the right to vote a couple, three years later with the passage of the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, but Kansas women had to wait another 42 years. Uh, it, at that time, Article 5 was amended to um, add section, section 8, women's suffrage. This amendment to the state constitution was submitted by the 1911 legislature and adopted by the people at the general election in, 19, in 19, November 1912. <clears throat> Excuse me, in large part because of the efforts of Clarina I.H. Nichols uh, and a few other determined women the Wyandotte Constitution did not totally ignore women's rights. Women were allowed to participate in running, school, running of the schools and thus school district elections. Article 2, Section 23 uh, gave uh, uh, passed, and the legislature, the legislature was instructed to write to accommodate women or make no distinction between males and females when providing for the formation of schools. Um, also, the legislature was to provide for the protection of, of rights, of property, protection of the rights of women to acquire and possess property separate and apart from their husbands and to have equal custody rights. Um, that comes in, set in Article 15, the miscellaneous part of uh, section, in section 6.
The Constitution also included uh, articles on education, public institutions, uh, the militia, which is Article 8, uh, in addition to the suffrage, uh, militia service was originally reserved for whites only. Article 8, the militia shall be composed of, uh, read, the Article 8 read, the militia shall be composed of all able-bodied white males between the age of 21 and 45 years. The word white was amended out of the Constitution, uh, but it didn't happen until 1887. Article 10, or Article 9, uh, was county organization. Uh, to date, only relatively minor changes have been implemented on that one, but uh, significant change uh, to Section 2 uh, could happen if the other amendment, the uh, having to do with the with sheriffs, uh, is uh, ratified by the voters in November. In Article 10, appropriation apportionment, which has, uh, which as you can see from the Ingalls quotation, uh, has always been controversial. Uh, there uh, was a temporary apportionment in Section 3 of this article, and then each organized county uh, shall have at least one representative comes in is the provision of, of Section 1. Major change to this article didn't come until 1974. Uh, and again, we can come back to this later on, but as I mentioned, apportionment uh, of the legislature. Oops. There was a final point the back Additional articles included those dealing with finance and taxation, corporations, banks and currency, and amendments. Article 15, 14, um, Article 14 uh, defined the process for amending the Constitution. Two thirds of all legislatures to propose, then a majority to vote, and all and then all and to, for for calling the constitutional convention, it also took two thirds. Section one of this article was significantly revised in 1970 to allow for five five amendments be considered uh, at the same time. Prior to that, it was, it was restricted to three, I believe, and to allow the legislature to call special elections for the purpose of ratifying amendments to the Constitution. The, uh, the problem was that the, the Kansas continued to, throughout the years, continued to refuse to call a constitutional convention. We'll come back to that in a minute. But in order to get around that, the legislature was able to uh, amend the Constitution so they could do more, amend, amend more easily, and uh, do it more often. And fin finally, Article 15, miscellaneous, originally included nine sections. To date, only seven additional sections have been added to this list. Uh, Section 10, which prohibited the manufacture and sale of intoxicating liquors. Uh, and finally, Section 16, the so-called marriage amendment, which defined marriage as between a man, one man and one and, and one woman only, it was ratified in in uh, April 2005, but it subsequently was struck down by the Tenth Circuit Court in 2014, and then of course the Supreme Court ultimately in 2015. So it's still there. On, on July 29, 1859, the Free State Wyandotte Constitution was adopted 
and sign. Uh, I'm missing something. There we go. And that didn't get far back on the, on the page. Okay. So the ratification, the Constitution was adopted and signed, uh, and uh, the uh, because because of the was objected to by several key because they objected to several key provisions. All seventeen. All 17 Democratic delegates refused to sign uh, the final document. So the signatures you see at the end of the document are only those of the Republican delegates to the Wyandotte Convention. And this set the stage for a very bitter partisan contest over ratification. I think that sums it up. A couple of weeks after the convention adjourned on August 14, 1859, Ingalls wrote to his John Ingalls wrote to his father. And I bring Ingalls in several times because his correspondence is, is pretty voluminous and uh, of interest. He's also, he was also represented in Statuary Hall. If you remember a few weeks ago when uh, Amelia Earhart was moved into uh, Congress or into the Statuary Hall in the uh, US Capitol, uh, she replaced John Ingalls. Uh, which is an interesting story, uh, but uh, not one we'll stop on here unless you would like to go back to it. But he is a, a, an interesting figure during this period and for a number of years thereafter. Um, but as you can see from this, uh, this quote, the Constitution is before the people and meets with very general approbation. The Democrats are taking strong ground against it because it does not include Southern Nebraska and Pikes Peak, because it does not exclude free Negroes and on account of an apportionment that cannot fail to secure a large Republican majority in the state, in the state organization. Uh, very unapologetic in his uh, view of apportionment in this particular time. On October 4th, 1859, supporters won by nearly a two to one margin. Uh, even Leavenworth County, which had sent 10 Democratic delegates to the convention, voted narrowly in favor of the Wyandotte Constitution. But admission into the Union, uh, as, uh, into the Union of States was delayed, held up largely because of increasingly bitter North-South divisions in the United States Senate. But the election of, uh, if I, uh, but the, with the election of in November of, 18, of 1960 of Abraham Lincoln, Southern states began to lead the Union in opposition to the Kansas admission the, the, uh, decreased. The Senate passed the Kansas bill on January 21st, 1861, and a week later the House passed the bill to amend, and, uh, to amend bill as amended and sent it to the president for his signature. President James Buchanan signed the uh, bill on uh, making Kansas 34th state on January 29th, 1861. So since the first day, first Kansas day, the state's founding document, the Wyandotte Constitution, has served as the basis for the rule of law in Kansas for 161 years. It's a long time. So is it is this longevity reason enough to give it the document and the men who created it our attention? John A. Martin thought so. Two decades after its ratification, he was already marveling at the old document's staying power. In 1882, Martin spoke uh, of the largely unsuccessful efforts to change the original founding document in the first couple of decades. The legislature finally voted in 1879 to submit a proposal for a new, con new convention to the people, wrote Martin. The result was an endorsement of the old Wyandotte Constitution by a majority 
far more emphatic and overwhelming than that by which it originally was originally adopted. Samuel A. Kingman took a different position. By 1884, he thought it was time for a new doc, new one. Much had changed in, in the 25 years since, Wyand since Wyandotte. The state's growth and development, for example, was unanticipated uh, by the framers of the Constitution and, a great, uh, and to a great extent unprovided for. And it was then apparent for, uh, in, in uh, Kingman's opinion, that the instrument formed by a small community is inadequate for the wants of a the wants of a large one. From Martin to Kingman's from Martin and Kingman's time to the present, Kansas continued Kansas continued to reject calls for another constitutional convention, something most states have experienced at least once. But subsequent changes have modified the role of government in many ways and expanded and contracted individual rights. The progressive era was a time of considerable constitutional change, but the most significant came in the 1960s and 70s, uh, about one third uh, of the total amendments uh, were, were ratified and several entire articles were rewritten or replaced. In reality, so much has changed over the, uh, these 160 plus years that little of the original Wyandotte Constitution remains in effect. Nevertheless, as Professor K. Professor James Drury wrote, the Wyandotte Constitution provided the framework for making piecemeal changes, article by article and section by section. Flaw as it was, this founding document accomplished its prime, prime objective, prohibited slavery and provided for the admission of Kansas as a free state. It established a free, a free branch system of government. It included a Bill of Rights and provided for such things as elections, education, public institutions, and county and township organization. It certainly did not treat all Kansas residents equally, but the Constitution contained the procedures for amendment, amendments modified in recent times that uh, has, uh, has, at least until the 21st century, been largely used to extend rights and privileges to more and more people and make structural changes necessary for effective 21st, 20th and 21st century government. With that, uh, I'd certainly entertain uh, comments, questions, and have a little discussion on some of the issues that might be of, of interest. Yes. There was a quote by somebody about the exclusionary of free Negroes. Exactly, they weren't being excluded from the state, but it's not clear that in that comment that someone quoted that they were being excluded from voting. What did exclusionary actually mean? I'm sorry, I wasn't clear on that. Exclusion, uh, exclusionary clause did uh, prohibit the immigration of, of blacks, free blacks. Uh, and this was something that was quite common in the old Northwest during the pre Civil War period. The law legislatures had passed these kinds of laws. Uh, and uh, Kansas did not uh, pass that or include that in the Wyandotte Constitution, but there was a lot of sentiment in favor of it. Um, there may have been, and, and uh, I think this is what the that quote from the Fort Scott paper and several others who wanted it submitted to the people, it would have been a separate ballot to see if the majority of Kansans wanted the exclusionary clause, either in the Constitution or uh, maybe an indication for the legislature to do that early on, because that could have been a legislative action too. I think a lot of the delegates thought maybe it would go that way. They didn't want it in the Constitution uh, for a variety of reasons, but they would probably, a lot of them would have been willing to accept that if it had gone that direction. Mm -hmm. Are we missing the issue where blacks welcomed or 
Absolutely not. If you come here but you can't vote, you can't do anything else, what what would be the sentiment there? Yeah, well there's certainly there were a few. Uh, I um, could have highlighted one or two, three people who were more open to equal rights, uh, even voting perhaps. Uh, but most of uh, the delegates would have not excluded them because of, uh, I think most of the delegates would have let them come, but you, yeah, you're right, they weren't in the uh, because they couldn't vote. Um, they, there was a lot of question about what would happen with schools. Most didn't want to put any restrictions in the Constitution, but it was clear that the first legislature, which was going to set up the school system, would have either provided for separate schools or you know, there was something that, that would have kept it. A lot of the delegates were very concerned about mixing of the races. Uh, so in a lot of different ways, they were very concerned about that issue. Yeah. Well, but I thought the local level, you have the Civil War and the country games uh, coming over into Kansas by thousands. Um, and when you mentioned the militia excluding blacks, do you mean the state militia or locals? Because I know there were local militias to uh, push back uh, Sterling Price's, um, uh, what was it called, invasion of Kansas in 64. And those were, yeah, those were local militias. Uh, the, uh, there was no state militia as far, well, there could have been, there would have been ultimately, uh, but this would be the local, uh, local uh, prohibition, prohibition. Uh, you said that there were uh, 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 17 uh, Democrats at the uh, Wyandotte Constitutional Convention, and only one uh, person from a uh, southern state, uh, that being Virginia. The question was, where did the other Democrats come from? That, that's something that really interested me when I first got in, involved with this. Um, you kind of think that, oh, they're probably all from Missouri, or they're from, a southern, from southern states. But they're uh, from the same states that, brought, that produced the Free Staters. Uh, one of the um, one of the uh, Democratic delegates who was most active uh, was a, a man named a uh, young man from Leavenworth named Samuel Stinson. He was from Maine. Uh, the other active ones were from Ohio and from the various other states that I listed off. Uh, they were Northern Democrats. At the time, they weren't necessarily men who would. There was there was one man, the one man that voted against uh, prohibition against slavery, or would have voted for Kansas to be a slave state. Was of I think his name was Foreman. I can't remember off the top of my head, but he uh, had been a member of the bogus legislature, uh, so he was a true pro-slavery guy. I think. I think he was the only one. By that time, these other delegates that were Democrats were like Buchanan Democrats or Douglas Democrats who were kind of soft on the South. They were willing to allow the slavery to continue, partly because they were afraid of what would happen if they got rid of it, but they weren't uh, much different in a lot of ways than the, than the Free Staters at that time or the Republicans. Uh, and after the war started, most of those people that I know of uh, would be unionists. You don't, I don't think you have, um, you might have one, I can't remember right now, but I don't think you had any of those people joining the Confederacy or in favor of secession. Those people would probably already have left Kansas by 1859, 1860, um, and were, or were making plans to, uh, because there wasn't too much future for um, pro Southern sympathizers after the war, after we started moving. But there were quite a few Democrats. Have most amendments, let's say in recent times, uh, maybe you said there were quite a few amendments in uh, the late 20th century. Uh, so late 20th century to now, have most amendments that have made it to the ballot passed? Good question, but I don't know. I, I, uh, yeah, no, I don't, I'm not even going to guess on that one. I wish I did know that. That was one of my qualifiers before I started was going to be that 
I'm not a constitutional scholar, I'm just a Kansas historian. Uh, so uh, we had to look elsewhere for that. And that was something I didn't think to find out. Um, no, I'm not getting into this. Does anybody happen to know? In regards to uh, one of the constitutional amendments on the ballot in November uh, regarding the sheriffs, if I understand right, not having reread the uh, Kansas Constitution recently, there, there is no mention of county elected officials in our Constitution, as I, I think. And so if this amendment passed for the sheriffs, it would be the first mention in our Constitution of an elected county official. Is that right? I should pull up the Constitution and look. <laughs> I think that's right. Um, the legislature was instructed by the Constitution to make provisions for um, county and township government. But I don't believe it's, the Constitution spells out what exactly that will be. Um, anybody else can help me out on that one? I'll look it up. Um, but yeah, and that, the, the, as I understand it, the, the deal with sheriffs is uh, they have all, we elect them in all counties, except the one, uh, and this would, a minimum would make sure that that was always the case, that there wouldn't be any more exceptions. Um, and it also, that's something with supervision of those, uh, or bringing action against um, the uh, sheriff who happens to be violating the laws. Anything else? Here's that the amendment, both for this and for the issue about the judges, is all about the legislature having the power to determine anything. Uh, we're not we're not necessarily putting the question to a vote to the populace. The legislature can just decide whatever they want. Yeah, I think all all of these moves have been can only be interpreted as in efforts to to uh, increase the power of the legislature over, over the, uh, in different ways. Uh, the legislative veto, obviously, uh, which is the other one, uh, would take power away from the government, which interestingly is kind of going the other direction from where we came in, 70, in the 70s, uh, because the power of the executive was increased, and it's kind of grown ever since, with it, I think, uh, essentially accepted in a bipartisan way recently, uh, that that was modern government would be uh, more power and more uh, controlled by the executive branch. And, and this follows the concept that the uh, abortion amendment was following in August, that the legislature would have the power to decide everything. It's the only chance that the populace has to make a stand. And so we yeah, I think the the, uh, the question of uh, amendments. I think it, it goes up and down. I mean, I think more re in recent times we had there has been a tendency to go to amending the Constitution a little quicker than what many people would think we should. There's a, there's a number of things that have gone. You know, the adding to the Bill of Rights right to protection for hunting and fishing um, that passed overwhelmingly uh, in. Is it 2010, I think, that's it. Um, I'm puzzled by that. I'm, I'm sure I voted against it. I couldn't, I couldn't swear to it. But it's like 80% of the population, the electorate voted for that. Um, when it's something that probably should never have been on the ballot. I mean, it, it's already a part of the, it was already a part of the Constitution uh, at that time in terms of the uh, Amendment 4, I think, the right to bear arms. <laughs> I did. I did say that I would uh, mention something about the the uh, original the document itself, if I had a chance. 
Oops. Um, I actually got interested in in this um, maybe not for the first time, but as a, in professionally when I started working with the historical society, and in, in the late eighties, the uh, the original, original Constitution was still on display. I mean, I'm sure some of you remember that. Uh, in the lobby of the Memorial Building um, in Topeka. Uh, and it, uh, it was, um, the document itself was engrossed, handwritten, uh, as you can see from some of my slides, on eight sheets of paper. The, it was in 1859. For four copies at least, and I'm not positive what format those took, because they were doing printing and things too very quickly. But there were four copies, official copies made, one for the President of the United States, one for the President of the Senate, and one for the Speaker of the House, I believe, and then one kept in the state, the Secretary of State had it, until 1906 when it was transferred to the State Historical Society, the State Archives, and it was kept in a tube. It, was, it had been pasted together, eight sheets of paper pasted together and rolled, and that was the way it was kept until 1948, when they decided to print the split. And so it was taken out of the cylinder and uh, put in a case like this. That was, oops. That's the way it was displayed in the lobby of the Memorial Building until the uh, until 1961, when as part of the centennial of the state, they just dressed up the exhibit and ex displayed it, the original document uh, in that way. And it was there until uh, 19 until the 19 uh, 1989 when it was removed and the. Uh, and I was, I was involved, I was working for the state at that time and involved in working on the exhibit. They wanted to show the, the Constitution in the, in the Capitol. And I think, as I recall, some of us, or some people, probably our conservationists at the museum, talked them out of displaying the original document. So currently, if you go to the state archives, you can see a new exhibit of the state Constitution, which has been in the lobby of the uh, of the new, the, it was new in nineteen in nineteen ninety five. Uh, the state archives part of the, of the museum of history in West Topeka. So there's a, a new exhibit that's quite different than that, but it displays a uh, photographic used used photographic copy of the document. And now the eight sheets are in the safely uh, stored in the State archives, and not probably going to be brought out on might be brought out on special occasions in the exhibit of the for not for any other time. There's been quite a bit of fitting, as you can imagine, that went on during those years. It was in the lobby, even though they took some precautions. Uh, it was uh, not as much, not as well protected as it should have been. Any other questions? You're reminding me of, um, you had, you said there were 17 names signed to the wine dot. You had that one image of, of how the signatures of, or, or, 32. 30, okay, 32 signed. I was curious how, when you go to the, is it the state house that you have the images and names of some of the founders of Kansas around it? I was curious if you might know how they chose which of those men to put up in the house. I actually did some research on that too, uh, but uh, it uh, I, we did it was never determined as far as I can, as I remember we didn't determine what criteria was used. <laughs> you think so? <laughs> uh, that story about uh, Ingalls and in the in the uh, Century Hall in Washington, uh, he was there with George W. Click. You get it. Gold star, if you know who George W. Glick was. Oh, okay. <laughs> that doesn't count. Um, he was actually a former governor of uh, the 19th century, one of 
few Democrats uh, elected to the state house. Um, first one, actually, but he was from Atchison. Um, Ingalls was from Atchison, and then I think and this is this is some of this is conjecture, speculation, and I don't know that I don't know the details of the story and I don't know if they, they really exist, but that's. It was in 1912 or 1913 when the Democrats gained control of the legislature for like the first time uh, in Kansas. Um, there was a move to fill Kansas's two spots in statutory hall. So I think it was a bipartisan effort <laughs> to select two Atchison people. Why from Atchison? I think the legislature. I can't remember now, but I believe the legislator that was promoting this was from Atchison, and that's what they did. It's kind of interesting that they picked, uh, um, I don't know if they knew this, you know, but they picked Amelia Earhart, of course, who's her, her Kansas claim is Atchison, so maybe that's important. And of course, a number of years ago, uh, George Glick was replaced by White Eisenman in, in Statue Hall. That was not supposed to happen, but actually, you know, we were, the states were never supposed to uh, remove or change their mind. And Kansas is one of the first ones to do that. That got through, uh, for better or worse. Um, and George Glick came to Topeka, came back to Topeka. So. So now have two spots. Yeah, all states had two spots. And I think now, I'm not sure, for a long time, some states did not fill their, their spots. And Kansas was slow. In making that decision, of course, of who would go there, and all of a sudden it just happened. And it would be interesting to know what went into that. They, who are you going to pick? Why, why these two? What does their argument be? <laughs> With Eisenhower and, and they are, you know, it's pretty non partisan Okay, anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.